जय भीम एवरी वन वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल एंड विशिंग यू अप्पी बर्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ बाबा साहब आंबेडकर इट्स एन ऑनर फॉर मी टू मॉडरेट टूडे सेशन फ्रॉम महू द बर्थ प्लेस ऑफ बाबा साहेब माय नेम इज प्रशांत आई हैव कम्प्लीटेड माय मास्टर्स इन सोशल वर्क फ्रॉम टीस मुंबई एंड आई एम करंटली वर्किंग विद नॉन प्रॉफिट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इन मध्य प्रदेश ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द ऑर्गेनाइजिंग कमिटी आई एम डिलाइटेड टू एक्सटेंड हार्ट फेल्ट वेलकम टू ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट ऑफ अम्बेडकर इंटेलेक्चुअल समेत Your presence today is not only deeply appreciated, but also crucial as we gather to commemorate the legacy and intellectual contribution of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. The ideas of Dr. Ambedkar, such as social justice, equality, and Buddhism, continue to resonate deeply and in inspiring generation globally. This summit provides us with a platform to explore his visionary ideas, engage in meaningful discussion, and chart a path towards a more inclusive and just society. as we begin this intellectual journey let us embrace the diversity of thought encourage dialogue and cultivate mutual understanding your insight perspective and contribution are invaluable as we collectively strive to uphold the principle and values that dr ambedkar tirelessly advocated throughout his life may this summit serve as a source of inspiration learning and collaboration where ideas flourish and connections strengthen let us honor dr ambedkar legacy by reaffirming our commitment to social justice and equality for all once again a heartfelt welcome to the ambedkar intellectual summit may our time together be enriching and transformative um hello everyone jay bhim i am one of the co-host of this session my name is samiksha mishra and i am a phd candidate at the international buddhist college thailand Once again I would like to welcome you all into this session of Ambedkar Intellectual Summit 2024. The topic of our today's session is Dr. Babsab Ambedkar and Buddhism. Before we start let me give you a brief outline of our session. First I will be giving a short introduction of our guest speaker. Then there will be a talk for 40 minutes followed by question and answer and conclude this session with a few announcements. now without taking much time allow me to introduce you all our guest speaker steven bachelor so steven bachelor is a scottish buddhist author and teacher known for his writings on buddhist subjects on his leadership of meditation retreats worldwide he has been a practicing buddhist for the past four decades he started his training when he was about 19 years old He went to India, where he lived for four years in the community around the Dalai Lama in Dharamshala. Subsequently, he trained in Europe in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries and spent four years as a monk in a Zen monastery in South Korea. In 2015, he co-founded Bodhi College, a European educational project dedicated to the underst understanding and application of early Buddhism. Throughout his journey, Bachelor has primarily focused on his work as a writer, translating and authoring books. Some of his publications have gained significant recognition, particularly "Buddhism Without Beliefs," followed by "Living with the Devil," "Confession of a Buddhist Atheist," and "After Buddhism." He teaches meditation and Buddhist philosophy. He has also worked as a chaplain in the British prison system. This has led him to think more and more of the Dharma as something that speaks to our conditions of modernity, the kind of world we live in now, and this he has started calling secular Dharma. A warm welcome to you, sir, and we are very happy to have you. Thank you for being with us. You are unmute, sir. You are muted. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Samiksha, for that uh, that introduction. And I'd like also to thank um, Mangesh and many others who have uh, been who have made this uh, meeting uh, possible. So I think of you as my brothers and sisters in the Dharma, and it's a great honor and a privilege to be here with you on the hundred and thirty third. A birth anniversary of Baba Sab, Doctor Ambedkar. The title of my talk um, I've slightly changed to uh, Baba Sab Ambedkar and secular Buddhism. So I'm not going to be looking at Baba Sab Ambedkar's understand relationship to Buddhism as a whole, but I want to focus 
on what he might have had to say to the idea of a secular Buddhism. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, as we go along. Uh, ever since I lived in India 40 years ago now, I've been aware of Dr. Ambedkar's work. Um, I've had friends, um, uh, disciples of uh, Ugyan Sangharakshita, who I also knew, who kept me very much informed of the work that uh, your community is doing uh, to keep alive Dr. Ambedkar's vision. When I was in India earlier this year, in January, um, I had the great uh, uh, privilege of meeting Dr. Ambedkar's uh, grandson at the Chaitya Bhumi uh, in Mumbai. So I feel that I have a connection with you. I don't exactly know uh, what that is, uh, but it's certainly based on a sense of a shared uh, respect for the extraordinary man that Dr. Ambedkar was. But I also have to tell you that I'm not um, in many ways at all like Dr. Ambedkar. I'm not a social and political activist uh, like uh, Dr. Ambedkar at all. I have been involved in Buddhism uh, for some time, for about 40 or 50 years now. But my path has been less involved in the activist side of Buddhism, but rather in the philosophy. I think of myself as a Buddhist philosopher rather than an activist. Um, perhaps even we could use the word a theologian, somebody who thinks about the core ideas that animate the Dharma. So as a thinker in this way, I see my role not to be one of reforming society, but one of reforming Buddhism itself. Now, I think in reality, reforming society, reforming Buddhism, uh, you know, can, are always going to go together. They're not really separable. But my area of... Um, of interest is primarily about trying to get to the core of what the Buddha taught. And I think that in our day and age, in the 21st century, uh, we can't just simply uh, repeat what traditional Buddhist uh, teachers and texts have been saying for the last 2,500 years. Um, I think we have to really step back from our legacy of Buddhism, in particularly in Asia, and go to the core of what Gautama uh, Buddha taught and to try to understand what constitutes the, real, the, the beating heart of the Dharma. And this process, I feel, will enable us to rethink the Dharma in a way that might speak more directly to our conditions today. I don't think this is an unusual idea. Throughout its history, Buddhism has gone back to its sources and it's rethought the Dharma and made it available, let's say, to people living in China or Tibet or Japan, at each phase in its history, it has had to reinvent itself in some way. And I've come to call my approach to the Dharma uh, secular Buddhism, although I tend now to prefer the word simply secular Dharma. Very briefly, what I mean by that is to try and imagine a dharma that is concerned entirely with this world and the suffering of this world, both now as we experience it personally, in our communities, in our societies, but equally a concern for the world as it will continue um, long after we are gone, long after our deaths. 
So a secular approach is one that's concerned with this age, this time, uh, the world we live in now. And in that respect, I feel that this is very much in keeping with Dr. Ambedkar's own vision. He was not interested in just preserving Buddhism. He saw Buddhism as a way whereby to free um, uh, the, uh, the former untouchable, the Dalit community, uh, into a, a very different kind of community within India as it has come to be now. So I think in many ways, um, there is a sympathy between a secular approach to the Dharma and the kinds of ideas that Dr. Ambedkar expressed in his own writings, in his own talks that he gave during his life. And I'd like to actually base this talk upon a text um, that comes from Dr. Ambedkar himself. It's found in uh, 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 an essay called Buddha and the Future of His Religion, which is included in a short booklet uh, called Dr. B. R. Ambedkar on Buddhism. Uh, it's on page 32 of that booklet if you want to look it up. And it's a very short passage I'm going to read to you now. The religion of the Buddha, says Dr. Ambedkar, is morality. Morality is embedded in the religion. Buddhist religion is nothing if not morality. In place of God, there is morality. What God is to other religions, morality is to Buddhism. I think it's very clear from that passage that Dr. Ambedkar gives central importance to the idea of morality. He finds in the idea of morality uh, the be all and end all of the Buddhist religion. The Buddhist religion, he says, is nothing if not morality. Morality replaces what God is to other religions. This is a very, very strong claim. It's also a claim that would not really reflect traditional Buddhist teaching, where morality is usually considered one part of the practice. But here, Baba Sab Ambedkar is saying it's the very thing itself. I'm sure we all have different understandings of what might here be meant by morality. When I read the word morality today, uh, I immediately think of another idea, and that is the idea of ethics. And what I want to focus on uh, this morning or this afternoon for you is the relationship between morality and ethics in Buddhism. And hopefully by doing that, I feel we might be able to get a clearer sense of what Baba Sab Ambedkar meant by morality in that uh, quotation I just read. I think for many of us, and it's certainly true for myself, uh, these two terms, morality, ethics, um, are kind of interchangeable. Um, if Unless you're a professor of philosophy or something, you probably use these words. Um, sometimes you talk of a person as being a very moral person. You might talk of a person as being a very ethical person. And you're not quite sure exactly what the difference is. What's the difference? Maybe you can ask yourselves now between morality and ethics. They sound different. But I'd like to really explore where that difference lies. Um, in some ways, they simply overlap. And I'm also not at all sure how Dr. Ambedkar himself understood the term morality uh, back in the 1940s and 1950s. I have a feeling that the, the use of the term has moved on since, since, since then. 
So let me offer at least one way of distinguishing between morality and with ethics. Uh, this is a distinction that is not just my own. Uh, in a lot of contemporary uh, philosophical discourse, in moral philosophy, these distinctions are now becoming more and more uh, common. I will think, when I use the word morality now, I think of it very much as observing precepts, um, obeying the law, um, following the customs of the society, living in accordance with other people according to commonly accepted rules, regulations, precepts, and laws. And the purpose of that is largely social. In other words, people to live together in society need to accept basic codes of conduct that will ensure a degree of harmony and order and well-being within their community. Let's give an example of morality in Buddhism. I think a good example would be the five uh, precepts of not killing, not stealing, not abusing, not lying, and not indulging in intoxicants. In other words, these are five basic rules that lay Buddhists are expected to observe. And that, for me, is a good example of morality. We could extend it further to the monastic uh, vinaya, the monastic rules uh, that monks and nuns uh, take. And in some traditions, you have 250 rules. Um, much more detailed than the five precepts, but the basic idea is the same. By keeping these rules, the society or the community of monks or nuns is able to maintain harmony and order within its ranks. Very useful, very necessary. Human beings cannot live without morality. Now, when we come to ethics, I think we don't leave morality behind, but we put morality into a somewhat bigger picture. Moral uh, ethics is also, I feel, a much more dynamic concept, whereas morality can be rather static. In other words, five precepts, 253 vows, uh, or the you know the legal code of a society, for example, that remains fixed. Ethics is far more about uh, how we become the kind of person we aspire to be, how we create the kind of society we wish to live in, and we wish our children and our descendants and other forms of life to live in. It's aspirational in that sense. It's about evolving and developing and growing as a person. The Greek word ethos uh, is the root of the word ethics. Ethos in Greek means something like character. Ethics is how you develop your character. It's about how you evolve as a person. And it has a great deal to do with um, becoming more conscious of what your primary values are, to be much more conscious of what you wish to dedicate your life to, in other words, your core orientation in how you live. In short, we might say that ethics is about uh, human flourishing. This is another term that is taken from the Greek. Uh, the Greek word eudaimonia is now often translated as a life of, of flourishing, a life in which you, you bring forth uh, your potential, your capacities, and live them to the full. Therefore, the practice of ethics is really the practice of the Dharma, I would argue. It's about training one's mind. It's about being conscious of one's speech, 
and one's acts and the effects of both of those on others. And therefore, it's not just an individual process of becoming a better person, though hopefully that's uh, going to happen as well. But it's also very much about uh, creating a community. And in the bigger picture still, it's about creating society. You can't separate the individual man or woman from the community and the society in which they are embedded. So if we're going to flourish as an individual, we're also setting an example uh, to others within our community and in our society. We're seeking to embody the values and the virtues that we hold to most deeply. So in this sense, clearly there's something of morality involved as well, but ethics takes that into the wider sense of becoming a flourishing human person within the society in which you live. So what would be an example of ethics um, as opposed to morality in Buddhism? For me, a very good example would be the taking of refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Buddhang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami. I go for refuge to the Buddha, I go to refuge for the Dharma, and I go for refuge uh, in the Sangha. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, or many of you are, and you might just be familiar with it as what you recite before a talk or before a ceremony or before a meditation retreat. Um, and it's often just uh, understood as a sort of formula that defines you as a Buddhist. But I think the taking of refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha is more than just a formula. It's more than just uh, an indicator that you are a Buddhist rather than a Muslim or a Hindu or a Christian. Taking refuge um, is for me an ethical act. And it's ethical precisely because it uh, sets the framework for your aspiring to become a particular kind of person and aspiring to create a particular kind of society. So when we say, you I take refuge in the Buddha. We're not saying that you we, I take refuge in the historical Buddha Shakyamuni or Gautama, um, and I consider myself a follower of that historical person. Uh, Buddha is not equivalent to that human person, but Buddha really refers to the condition of being awake. And <clears throat> so taking refuge in the Buddha is taking refuge or putting your trust, let's say, in your capacity to be more awake and less asleep with the idea that the historical Buddha was not some divine figure who came from God, but was a human being like us who, through his own efforts and practices, became awake, became the Buddha, that we too uh, have the same potential within ourselves. So in other words, Buddha becomes a, a metaphor or a symbol of what we seek to become ourselves. And that's ethics, becoming what one aspires to be. In a Buddhist frame, that means becoming like a Buddha. The second refuge is uh, taking refuge in the Dharma. Again, the word Dharma is widely used in Buddhist circles, and it very often simply means the teachings. People might say that they're going to hear a talk on the Dharma, uh, or the Dharma is a, 
you know, a philosophy or something. But the Dharma is a lot more than that. And it's certainly in taking refuge in the Dharma, you're not taking refuge in a, in a body of, of doctrines, uh, an orthodoxy, an ideology at all. You're taking refuge in a set of ideas, yes, in a set of values, yes, but you're taking a refuge primarily in a path, in a way of life. To take refuge in the Dharma is to, cult, is to cultivate a path, a way of being that creates and sustains the conditions for being more awake and less asleep. Perhaps the most succinct way of um, uh, describing the Dharma or the practice of the Dharma is through the idea of the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Noble Eightfold Path um, pre presents us with those fields of our experience that we can cultivate and develop very often, at least in the West, uh, the Dharma or the practice of the Dharma is focused upon the practice of meditation. And certainly meditation is part of this practice. Uh, the samasati, sama samadhi, uh, in other words, right mindfulness and right concentration are in fact the last two steps of the Eightfold Path. So clearly they are important. But very often what happens um, in Buddhism is that the other aspects of the Eightfold Path, uh, the way we see the world, the way we think, the way we speak, the way we work and our living, those are kind of put to the side. And more and more you find that if you uh, if, if, if you ask a teacher, well, how can I really practice the Dharma? They'll suggest that you become a monk so you can then have the time to meditate and to free yourself from ignorance and delusion and so on. Um, reinforcing the notion that uh, spiritual practice, um, at which monks, of course, are, are, are specializing in, is really what the Dharma practice is about. Um, I would challenge that. I feel that today we need to make every step of the Eightfold Path into a practice of the Dharma. So if you're a communicator, let's say, then your practice is the practice of speech. Um, if you're a, a philosopher, then your practice will be the practice of thinking. And so thinking and speaking and doing and acting and working and being mindful and being concentrated all have equal importance. There's not any one of them that is more significant uh, or necessary than any other. So this is a practice of the Dharma, therefore, that um, engages the whole of our life, not just the spiritual part of ourselves, but everything that we do, everything in our social relations, in our political life, in our economic life, this can all become a practice of the Dharma. So to take refuge in the Dharma is therefore to take refuge in a way of life, a way of being fully human in this world. And then thirdly, uh, we take refuge uh, in the Sangha. And this is about creating a community, um, a community that supports you, in the practice of this path of the Dharma, which we're now seeing as extending to the whole of your life, in order that you can become more and more like a Buddha, more and more awake. Sangha is not something that is kind of already there, like a community of monks, um, that, you, that you simply have to somehow go to and honor and uh, support, but Sangha or community is something that we are constantly called upon to create. Um, and this is created largely through cultivating friendships, 
through developing organizations, associations. It has to do with bringing people together uh, to somehow be able to have the power of more than one person to engage in fulfilling what we most highly value. Um, whereas, again, we often find in Buddhism that the Sangha refers to the monks. In other words, the professionals, uh, those who have formally dedicated their lives to this kind of practice. And it's true that in the early Buddhist texts, the word Sangha is also used almost entirely uh, for, the, um, for the communities of monks and nuns. Whereas the word Sangha was already in use at the Buddhist time to refer to the, uh, uh, the, the assemblies the, that governed the early republics in India. These were called Sanghas. This is where the Buddha got the term. But it's become, for one reason or another, associated with the professional bodies of monks and nuns. Uh, one of the whole questions within a secular Buddhism is the role of religious professionals, uh, monastics, basically. Um, do they really need to have such a central and defining role? Do they really need to be the carriers of Buddhist tradition and orthodoxy and authority? Or are we moving into a more post monastic sense of community. I'd be interested to know how many monks or nuns there are, are listening to this presentation. I doubt very many. But it's a really important question, I feel, for how Buddhism evolves in a secular world. I'd like to just spend um, a few minutes Again, on the basis of this idea of refuge, looking at what I mean by a secular dharma. Uh, so that's the second refuge, taking refuge in the dharma. What would a secular dharmic practice look like? Traditionally, Buddhism, in all its schools, has taken uh, the Four Noble Truths to be the kind of the, uh, the bedrock, the ground on which the Dharma uh, is, is built, uh, is developed. And um, clearly that's something I'm sure you're all very much aware of. I'm talking about reconfiguring Buddhism to make it somehow more suited, more adaptable to a secular world. And I feel that in many ways, the Four Noble Truths present us, again, with something that's fairly static. In other words, life is suffering, the cause of suffering is craving, uh, the end of suffering is the end of craving, and the way to the end of suffering is the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. In other words, these are four uh, truth claims. Uh, they're propositions in logical language where uh, a certain uh, set of truths um, are established and that becomes the basis for then how you think and understand your practice. If we go back to the Buddha's very first discourse, uh, however, we find that um, although he starts by presenting the Four Noble Truths, he then goes on and concludes this discourse with um, a definition of what it means to be fully awake. And to be fully awake for the Buddha is to have recognized and to have performed and to have mastered a set of tasks, things to do rather than things to believe. But this often gets forgotten. It's a bit like 
morality in a way. Morality gives us the precepts. Ethics is perhaps looking at something rather larger than that, but it's often the, the precepts that remain and the ethics gets kind of lost in a way. And I think the same with the noble truths. The truths get remembered. Everyone knows who's a Buddhist will know what the four noble truths are, but I suspect very few Buddhists, traditional Buddhists, uh, understand what the four tasks are that relate to those four truths. So what I've tried to do in developing this approach to Buddhism is to give more emphasis to the tasks than to the truths. So the first task is to embrace suffering, or the word in Pali means to fully know suffering, to open your mind and your heart to the reality of not only your own, but the suffering of others as well. So in, it's an act. It's not just believing that life is suffering. In fact, I think that's a, a questionable claim, to be honest, but rather to start with the idea that when I encounter pain, duk, whether it be in my own mind or my own body, or whether it be in the suffering of an animal that I see on the side of the street, or whether it be the suffering of an oppressed community in an unjust society, I open myself to that suffering. I try to understand it. I try to somehow empathize with what's going on uh, in order to be able to then reflect on how I can respond to it. So suffering is not abstract. Suffering is always found in a particular instance of suffering. Personal, collective, doesn't matter. It's something that we encounter. And as that uh, encounter occurs, then can we say yes? Not in the sense of yes, that's good, because it might be terrible, but to be able to be open in heart and mind to what is actually happening. If we're going to effect any change in the world, we need to understand the world, the structures of society in which we live in order to embark on any meaningful change. The second task is letting craving be. In other words, when we encounter suffering, very often what happens is that automatically uh, we react in some way. Uh, we either are drawn towards something or we want to push it away or we feel uh, somehow indifferent about it or we want to somehow turn the situation to our personal advantage. And these things just rise up within us. And I like to talk of them rather than just as craving, which I feel is a little narrow, uh, to speak of them as simply reactivity. We react. And the task here is to not get caught up in your reactivity, which is so easy to do. Our thoughts, our emotions trigger us uh, to say, or do uh, something that we might later regret. Greed, hatred, delusion, the three fires or, or, or poisons are three of the central features of reactivity. So becoming aware of how we react and learning to just let that be rather than acting on it or rather than trying to suppress it. You know, I'm a spiritual person, we might think. I'm a Buddhist. I can't feel this anger, so I push it down. I pretend I'm not angry. Letting reactivity be is to accept it and let it play itself out by not following it through, by not getting entangled or caught up in it. And as we do that, we find that we experience more and more moments in which we're not being reactive. We see reactivity stop, maybe just for a few seconds, a few minutes, maybe longer, maybe in meditation, 
maybe when we're just walking down the street, doesn't matter, but we notice at times that we come to rest, that we achieve a certain stillness within us. Obviously, meditation is about developing that stillness, but in many ways, whether we're doing art or whether we're engaged in a meaningful work, we very often find ourselves naturally in a state of still, clear awareness. And that is something that needs, again, to be cultivated, but also simply we need to recognize that and value the fact that we can be non-reactive in this world. Even in the midst of all kinds of difficulty and turmoil, there are moments when we can just see it for what it is and we don't get caught up, overwhelmed by what's going on. And that, to me, is a moment of nirvana. Nirvana for the Buddha uh, is defined simply as the stopping of greed, of hatred and delusion. And that doesn't mean after you're dead or when you're a highly realized arahant, but it occurs all the time in small ways throughout the course of our lives. And the fourth task is to actualize the path. And the path, the Eightfold Path, is something that in this model emerges from those moments of stillness, those moments in which we're able to respond with care, with love, with wisdom to the situation we encounter, as opposed to just blindly react, just instead of just playing out our personal and social habits. The Eightfold Path is a path of life in which we're living from a non-reactive perspective, or at least we're trying to live from a non-reactive perspective. So that, in very brief, is what I feel for a secular dharma uh, can provide us with a kind of foundation. Embracing suffering, letting reactivity be, seeing reactivity stop, and actualizing the eightfold path. So we can, from in that way, we can respectfully put the four noble truths to one side. Uh, they're not really intrinsic, I feel, uh, to the Dharma, but rather have developed um, in the interests of making Buddhism uh, more compatible with the other religions of India. In other words, as a religious tradition that seeks the end of suffering, uh, which means essentially no longer being reborn, uh, no longer having to die. And I think from here, we can recognize that once we think of the Dharma as the practice of a series of tasks, then we can see how the practice in its entirety is ethical, because each of these tasks is an ethical task. Each aspect of our practice is one that hopefully leads us closer to our ethical goals of becoming the kind of person we aspire to be in creating the kind of world or society we seek to live in. And in that way, we might say that secular Dharma is ethics all the way through. And this, of course, brings us back to Baba Sab. Dr. Ambedkar's text that we cited uh, at the beginning of this talk. I'm going to respectfully slightly rephrase Dr. Ambedkar's text, replacing the word morality that he used with the term ethics. This is what it sounds like. The religion of the Buddha is ethics. Ethics is embedded in the religion. 
Buddhist religion is nothing if not ethics. In place of God, there is ethics. What God is to other religions, ethics is to Buddhism. I would like to think that Dr. Ambedkar understood morality, which I think he's using fairly generally, to be closer to what we would now mean by ethics. Of course, I might be wrong, but I find it for myself um, more, more helpful uh, to put ethics in pride of place as referring to this entire practice based on the three refuges, based on the four tasks. That is an ethical life. In conclusion, I'd like to make the claim that Baba Sab, Dr. Ambedkar, was a forefather of secular Buddhism. I see him as a figure who somehow embodied in his own life uh, the principles and values of what I understand to be secular Dharma. The fact that secularity was such an important idea to him is evident in the Indian constitution that he framed. He envisioned India, as you all know, as a secular state. And a secular state is one that does not privilege any particular religion, but tolerates all religions. There's something uh, very powerful, I think, in the idea of a secular state. And Baba Sab Dr. Angbekka, I think, was very, very aware of that. Recently, even the Dalai Lama has picked up on the idea of a secular ethics. He's written a book about it called Beyond Religion, in which he cites the Indian constitution and Dr. Ambedkar's role in that as having given him the idea of secularity. So in this way, I feel a very strong sense of connection uh, with Dr. Ambedkar's work because it fits so well, I feel, into the whole project of evolving a secular Buddhism, or as I would call it now, a secular Dharma. So thank you all very much. Um, that's um, all I have to say to you today. I hope that has been of interest to you. Uh, you haven't found it too, too boring or repetitive. And uh, we now have time left for um, questions uh, that you can either put in the chat um, or you can come online. But this is something that... Uh, this is something that Samiksha is going to take care of, I think. Yes, thank you, Stephen, for that uh, very thoughtful and uh, very enriching talk. Uh, I enjoyed it personally. It was quite a different approach uh, to the Buddha Dharma. And yes, uh, before we um, conclude, if there are some questions by our participants, then uh, you could raise your digital hand so I could call up your call, call out your name, or you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, if there are. Okay, if you have any questions, you could also type it uh, in the chat or you can just unmute, unmute yourself and ask, ask it. Okay, 
until somebody speaks up, uh, I would like to ask some question. Um, okay. Well, there's two I... digital hands have gone up. Okay. But anyway, if... Samiksha, you begin. Okay, let me begin. Well, that was very interesting uh, demarcation you have put for the morality and ethics. Well, um, I'm not sure you have, like, what will be the Pali word for that. Is that the Sheila will be translated for morality? And I'm not sure about the ethic. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, no, that's a very good question, actually, Samiksha. I don't think there is a Buddhist Pali word for ethics, mm -hmm. actually. I think it's a Western idea, um, or it's a Greek idea, really. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it fits very well uh, the notion of the Buddhist practice in its entirety. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I don't think there is, in fact, a corresponding word. Uh, Sila... I think translates quite well as, as as morality or morals or or virtues, even we might say. Um, uh, it's also interesting if you look at the um, the way the eightfold path is presented, particularly uh, the experience of entering the eightfold path or entering the stream, sotapati. Uh, when you become sotapati. Um, you uh, you lose three fetters, uh, three obstacles. Uh, and one of them is sila bata, sila bata paramasa. It's usually translated in English as attachment to rites and rituals. But this is not actually very accurate. The word used is sila, actually. Sila bata, sila means morality, actually. And um Bata or vrata in Sanskrit means something like rules or or, 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 or or systems or structures or something like that. And I think it means something like moral rules, sila bata. And that means that the person who enters the path is no longer bound to moral rules, to morality in the sense of something rigid and fixed. But that person who has become has entered the Eightfold Path, has become, in Pali, um, uh, what's the word, um, independent of others. It's become independent of others in the practice of the Dharma. And I think that independence is actually uh, a freedom uh, to lead an ethical life according to the, real, you know, the, the primacy being realizing the values that you would wish to live by, rather than leading your life purely according to a set of moral rules. Um, so yeah, I am introducing the term ethics um, in a way that's not, for which there's no exact equivalent in Buddhism. But I do find that so much of the Dharma is essentially an ethical practice in that sense. I find it's a very useful term uh, to to describe the practice as a whole. That's so very interesting. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask Chandrabhan, who has raised his digital hands. So could you please unmute yourself and speak? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarisha, for and debate. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for uh, taking us to uh, this journey towards uh, a new reading of Dhamma. Now, my question to you is uh, related to the two communities which we have in uh, India of the Buddhists. One is of the Tibetan uh, Buddhist uh, community, which is there in uh, scattered throughout the uh, India. And mm -hmm. then uh, the other community is of um, the Baba Sahib's Ambedkar's um, conversion and the post. Uh, the, largely the, the, the Maharashtrian Buddhist community, which comes from Ambedkar's tradition. Now, uh, scholars have worked on uh, these two communities and how uh, there is uh, there is there isn't any dialogue between these two communities. So, uh, and there are reasons for that. One community uh, is pretty much interested in uh, Buddhism, Buddhism's reading as its uh, anti-caste ethos. The other community is more sort of 
interested in uh, the monastic nature of Buddhism and referring to Tibetan. Now you are offering us a new reading of Buddhism, and I, I was uh, I was uh, I was thinking how these two communities will uh, receive this new Buddhism. So any thought um, on, on this? Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chandraban. Um, well. My, having been a Tibetan Buddhist monk for many years and, and speaking the language and so on, uh, the Tibetan Buddhist community is not very enthusiastic about these ideas. And in fact, I'm considered essentially an, a, a, a heretic, as someone who has who's lost the true teaching and has gone off in his own direction, which is not regarded as legitimate, really. Um, I get a lot of critics uh, within the Tibetan Buddhist community. And having been part of that community myself, I can understand exactly why they have problems with what I'm saying. It isn't orthodox. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I was trained as a Gelugpa monk, uh, and we were taught very, very clearly not to accept teachings just because they're in the text or because the Buddha gave them, but to analyze them with logic and reason and to, um, uh, in the same way that a, a goldsmith would, would uh, analyze a piece of metal to see if it were gold. And, the, and they quote, a, the Tibetans quote a passage from the, uh, the suttas. I think it probably goes to the early texts. Uh, which says that you shouldn't accept these teachings just because you have faith in me, but you need to uh, examine them carefully in the same way that a goldsmith analyzes a piece of metal for gold. Now, I took that very seriously, and I feel that there is something within Buddhism that is, um, you know, a very, you know, rigorous, critical tradition. Uh, the fact that it's produced such different philosophies through its history, the fact that it's able to, you know, also offer critiques of other religions implies that, you know, it values critical thinking. So I see what I'm doing um, not as a betrayal of my Tibetan teachers, whom I hold in great respect, but as actually um, following the very instructions they gave me. I think one of the great crises of Tibetan Buddhism is that it has to survive in exile, in India primarily. And therefore, it's a tradition that gives great importance to its own preservation outside of its homeland. Um, the great tragedy of Tibetan Buddhism is that it hasn't survived as a very powerful force in its own country. I think if it had, it would possibly have developed more uh, a more critical approach to the Dharma. As for the other community, the community of which I've been speaking to here, if I understood you correctly, um, I think you need to find a way of thinking about the Dharma that is every bit as radical as Dr. Ambedkar had in his thoughts about uh, the situation in India in terms of justice, in terms of social um, equality and so forth and so on. I think we're at a time um, where we kind of have to put a lot of these traditional ideas into question. And um, as we move into modernity, as we become an increasingly global community, as we become a community that's less and less um, uh, you know, devoted to sustaining monastic uh, uh, monasteries and so forth. We're moving into a much more secular, much more lay kind of society. I think we require a rethinking of the Dharma itself that is more appropriate to that kind of world in which we live. And so I don't feel that my Tibetan friends are going to be very interested in what I have to say, but I think a community such as yours might find this kind of uh, thinking um, to be somehow already in a way in line with Dr. Ambedkar's own critical evaluation of certain Buddhist doctrines and teachings. But perhaps we have to go further. 
Um, and I find in my work, I get certainly uh, people who criticize what I do, who say it's not Buddhism, but I also get a, a huge amount of correspondence, uh, emails mainly now, from people who find that by thinking of the Dharma in this way, they found a connection to what the Buddha taught that um, previously they'd not been able to find. And so I've, I've, I feel that I'm speaking not to traditional Buddhists who have their own views and their own practices and so on, but to those of us who didn't grow up in a Buddhist family necessarily, who haven't had a, a Buddhist uh, upbringing, um, uh, or simply people who find that they cannot accept some of the basic Buddhist doctrines like reincarnation, for example, or some of the ideas about karma, um, and are looking for another way in which to frame their practice. And that's all I can offer. And if you find this is of help, then I'd, I'd be very glad to take this discussion further. If not, then, you know, then that's fine too. Thanks, it's, it's quite useful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I see one more hand by Ganesh. Could you please unmute yourself and speak? Hello, everyone. My voice is audible. Yes. Okay, right. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. First of all, I would thank for Stephen's survey because he has explored that various perspectives the Buddhism to embed there. Yeah, I, I, I'm, having, I'm having difficulty understanding. Could you speak a little more slowly? Okay, okay, all right. First of all, I would thank for Stephen's survey. Why? Because Sir says various points of in Buddhism to embed the perspective, very attractive way. Why? That's why. And to express my in my point, in my area, India is a one scholar is there, that is Kansa Aire sir. Kansa Aire sir is a delivered one statement. Why? Because there is without mud, there is no food. That is the productive community in their Indian society to explore that in Dalit, especially Bhaujans, to impact to implement it in own lives. That's why. Ambedkar view of the Buddhism, there is Buddha, monks are Buddhism, Buddha, Gautam Buddha. They only teach that the various ways of the traveling and teaches their whole life history. But uh, there is no to participate in the productive way of the productive products. That is the main important thing to please to explain that why Buddhism to participate in the productive way. There is okay. more. There is uh, one more thing. Well, and, let's just. Um, uh, I didn't actually understand. I could, the sound is not very clear here. Um, Samiksha, could you could could you just summarize the question? Okay. As okay. I was to hear him, he was talking about the monks, the productivity of monks, the Buddhist monk uh -huh. in India. Is that what Ganesh? What you were saying? We were talking about. Okay, I'll see sound from your side. Sir, kind this of is my first half spell that. So it's a question about the monks and monks okay. in it. In what way? Ah, monks in India. There is no to participate. They only teach us uh, Buddhist principles. Can I can I come in um, just to I, I I think I I have understood his question. Okay, yeah, you. Yeah, I think I, the, I think, uh, I, I, I think the question I think the question is, Buddha taught morality and how to lead a life, but he did not teach anything with regard to how to earn one's living. How to engage uh, in a process of production of various kinds that will ensure his livelihood. Like the other backward classes are, uh, uh, are many of the Dalits and uh, OBCs are involved in agriculture and related activities and many other activities to earn their living. 
whether Buddha said anything on those lines and what kind of activities we should engage when you are living. That's the question, I, I suppose. Okay, no, thank you. For, no, I understand now much better. Um, yeah. No, that is absolutely correct. Um, the texts that have come down to us in the Pali suttas and, and, and other sources um, don't really say anything at all about how a non-monastic lay Buddhist should live. There is only one discourse in the Pali suttas. It's called the Sigalavaka Sutta. It's in the longer discourses of the Diga Nikaya which is addressed to a lay person and it gives the Buddha's reflections and ideas about lay life, how to live. It's a very, very interesting text, but it doesn't really go into enough detail uh, to, to understand exactly how, uh, uh, let's say, a business person at the time of the Buddha would have run his business. We don't really know. And I think... You see, uh, my own view is that at the time of the Buddha, at the time of the Buddha himself, uh, there would have been lay people and there would have been monks and they would have been all involved in this practice. But the teachings that have come down to us are the teachings that have been memorized by the monks. And obviously the monks want to remember the things that speak to them. There's a great deal about monastic training in the Vinaya, in the monastic rule texts, also in the suttas, but the lay people, the, the non-monks, get kind of left out of the equation in many respects. So I think one of the challenges for our time, um, particularly if we are lay people, uh, is to look into the sources of the Buddhist teaching and try to find a basis from which we can develop a social theory, for example. And this, I think, is what Babasab Ambedkar was trying to do. He was trying to find elements within Buddhism that would support his own ideas about society, about um, you know, how to live in the world. But I think there's an awful lot more to be done. Um, and I don't think uh, myself or others have really tackled this topic adequately uh, to be able to present what would be a fully realized secular Buddhism. That, I think, is the challenge for us. We won't get much help by looking in the classical texts except a clearer sense of what the primary values are, but not on how you translate those values into the life of, say, working as a doctor or as an engineer or or even as as you know looking ra raising children we get nothing about that either uh, all of these are part of human life and i feel that the dharma needs to be able to engage with them all i hope that answers your question and then you've oh there's another one there um yeah, I'll just because it's the same question. I'll just quick in this chat. It says, "What does Buddha say about uh, women in the sangha?" Uh, well, this is an area where the Buddha was actually quite um, quite clear. He made no distinction at all between men and women in the sangha. Uh, he had a sangha of of monks. He had a sangha of nuns, and uh, men and women alike were considered able to realize the full fruits of the Buddhist path. In that, in that sense, the Buddha was very radical in terms of uh, his relationship to, to men and women. And I think it's in the, in the Buddhist suttas, you find, well, not the suttas, but in the, in the Pali Canon, you find a text called the Terigata, the verses or the, uh, the teachings of the, of the female saints. And I think it's probably the first time that you find in any religion, uh, a text written by women for women. So there, I think, but I'm, you do find a, a very clear statement there of the Buddha, but the, the nun order died out in India. It didn't survive. It, it, it died out before the monks, I think. And in Tibet, for example, it never found uh, its way into Tibetan Buddhism.
um, although it did in China and in Korea and in Taiwan. Anyway, um, okay, Sami, so what's the next yes. question? So, uh, Avati Ramaya. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, I'm so I really regret that I entered when you concluded your lectures, <laughs> and oh. the younger person uh, said thank you. I think I really missed uh, quite a deal. Uh, I'm Ramaya. I teach at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences there. Um, I am sure uh, the way you have been responding uh, to some of these questions uh, shows your depthness in Buddhism. Uh, my question um, here as a layman in Buddhist uh, in, uh, uh, literature that uh, you have a uh, um, we also have something known as Navayana Buddhism, which is now gaining uh, popularity. Mm -hmm. Here it also says, beside as to what to do and what not to do, uh, the Navayana Buddhism in the vows that Ambedkar listed, mm -hmm. there are vows as to don't worship this god, that god, mm -hmm. which pro probably you don't see in other literature. Here in Navayana Buddhism, he not only says, you should worship, uh, you should uh, go by what Buddha preached, but in addition, he's saying you should not be working some of these gods. Yeah. So, with, with this kind of an understanding, whether how open is the uh, traditional Buddhist, maybe with that what you represent, mm -hmm. uh, will be open to buy these kind of uh, um, uh, teachings. And uh, how open an American or an European who probably believe in uh, not in Buddhism but on in Christianity or any other faith, mm -hmm. who are um, a who have a scientific temper or who claim to be is having scientific temper would be open to Buddhism because even in in, in India among subcast this is a problem uh, though both claim to be a follower of Buddhism. But there mm -hmm. are challenges there because their subcast sub notion is so deep-rooted, they are unable mm -hmm. to come together. The, the extent we, we hope, whether Europeans and Americans, um, Christians lot, how open they would be, how, how, how open they are. To the Navayana Buddhism and yes. to the kinds of ideas. Um, yeah. Well, I think you get a lot of, I mean, let's. I can only really talk from the, the areas that I'm familiar, Europe, United States. Okay. Uh, but you get a mixture. You get some uh, Europeans and Americans who've had a, maybe a Christian upbringing, or they've had, you know, they've been trained as scientists, or, or they may not have had a religious background. Um, some of them are drawn very much to the religious aspects of Buddhism. They're drawn to uh, you know the, the the teachers. They're drawn to some of these uh, practices where you meditate on different deities and gods and so on in the Tibetan tradition, but also in in Chinese Buddhism too. So there is a pull towards that kind of um, a more traditional religious behavior, and they may not be so interested in yeah. Navayana Buddhism. They will probably are not very interested in what I'm doing either. But I think there's a much larger community um, who are looking uh, for a way of life that is more than just a kind of uh, humanism. In other words, a, just a sort of a watered down kind of uh, Christian ethic um, without the religion. But who are looking for, uh, you know, a spiritual religious uh, tradition that is able to identify the core values and practices that one needs to evolve as a person and a community, but one that is not involved in believing in gods or in metaphysics or uh, many of the things the Buddha himself paid no attention to. My sense is that when you go back to the early texts, in, in Pali particularly, um, you find uh, the Buddha, too, has no interest whatsoever in praying to gods. Um, in fact, he rather makes fun of the gods. Uh, there's passages where he makes jokes about Brahma, for example. 
And I think his approach is in many ways much nearer that of Navayana Buddhism, or, or that's the new way, I believe, in, in, in English, uh, that Dr. Ambedkar uh, envisioned. Um, so my sense is that there is a great, um, a great need, and I think a great longing for a form of spiritual practice that does not require you to believe impossible things, that does not uh, imitate uh, Christianity or Islam or other theistic religions, but finds its own way to be religiously committed to these values without the baggage of superstition, without the, uh, you know, the, some of the traditional Orthodox Buddhist beliefs. I think there's a great opening for that. And I, I, you know, I hope very much that the Navayana approach to Buddhism can be further evolved and developed in such a way that it really starts to speak to um, uh, the people of our world today. I think there's a, a thirst, there's a yearning for a spirituality that has broken free of uh, uh, of, of orthodox religious beliefs, including Buddhist orthodox beliefs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, Kshitish Moon, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir, sir. I wanted to ask in Buddha and his uh, Dhamma, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar said dharma, dharma is morality and morality is Dhamma. I think this statement clarifies. Yeah, quite catch it. It's more religious. It's. He said morality is dhamma and dhamma is morality in the text for the. Morality is karma and. And dhamma is morality. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, mm. Go on. Yes, sir. So I think this statement clarifies Baba Sahib's take, uh, mm. and you have inter interchange morality with ethics. How will you ex explain that? Well, I'm not exactly exchanging morality for ethics. Um, I'm, I'm recognizing that the, these are two terms that are, uh, that are a little vague in some ways, and people don't quite know how to distinguish them. Uh, I myself find uh, when I'm speaking to friends or giving a talk, I sometimes not quite sure whether to use the word moral or the word ethical. I don't know. In other words, there's a lot of overlap. But in how I've come to understand ethics, I feel it actually is closer to what um, Baba Sab Ambedkar meant by saying that uh, you know, the Buddhist religion is morality, the Dhamma is morality. I find it speaks more clearly to my understanding if we would think of, instead of morality, which I think is somewhat, for many people, rather limited as a set of you know, monastic precepts and so on, to think of it in terms of ethics. Um, and weirdly, I've been thinking along these lines quite independently uh, for some time. And only recently did I come across this passage that I quoted and saw what uh, Ambedkar said about uh, morality. Um, uh, this to me is really a, a question that we all have to ask if we want to pursue it. Um, and I think what it is, it is symptomatic in a way of a community that is looking for its own language. And each time Buddhism goes into a new country or into a new uh, historical period, it has to find another way of speaking. It can't just repeat what has gone on in the past. And so if you look at Buddhism in China um, or Japan, you find that the Chinese and the Japanese have, have, have incorporated uh, concepts of their own from Taoism or Confucianism or elsewhere and that they've become then part of the Buddhist tradition. And I feel a similar thing is going on as Buddhism now finds its way into, into global modernity. I'd rather say that than the West, which I think is an outdated idea. 
but as we move into modernity, as we move into a modernity that you know, is more and more an English speaking place, um, then we can draw on terminology, on ideas uh, that may not have their origin in Buddhism, uh, like many of the ideas in Chinese or Japanese Buddhism. Um, and uh, we can begin to find another way of communicating and speaking. And going back to the previous question, um, I think this is one of our great challenges is to, you know, how can we give voice to these values? We know what they mean, perhaps, for us. Uh, we've read a lot. We've, but often we're still in a language that a lot of people outside our circles do not really understand. I want to find a language that's idiomatic, uh, that is everyday English. Uh, and as soon as we get involved in distinguished you know, arguments about morality and ethics, we've already lost, I think, quite a lot of potential uh, people who would be interested because it's, it's become a technical discussion about in a semantics. Um, I think we can broadly, you know, keep both words. I don't think that's a problem. Um, but I've, you know, the reason I said what I did is to highlight how ethics is coming to be used uh, today, um, uh, coming out of the Greek tradition. And I think it's a language that actually suits uh, the articulation of Buddhism very well. Thank you so much, sir. That was like a really nice answer and very interesting talk, by the way. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, once again. Uh, that's a pleasure. Um, I only I have to go in a minute. Uh, uh in a, in about three or four minutes. Um, Samiksha, okay. do you have any? Would you like? Is there anyone else's hand up? Yes, no. there are a few more questions, and we are running out of our time, so. Okay. Let's see if we can take one or two questions and people are asking your contact number so they could directly reach out to you with their questions. Okay, I'll type in my email address. That might be oh, easy. Okay. okay. So can we take a few more questions, like one or two, if, my, if, if you allow me to take them? Yeah, please. No, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. So there is a question by Vidhai Prem asking, can you give your insights about materialistic tradition in India and its connection with Buddhism? Materialistic tradition? Yes. Um, I don't, I guess you're referring to the Charvaka school or something like that, uh, one of the ancient Indian philosophical traditions or the more recent? Uh, um, he's just uh, mentioning materialistic tradition in India. Materialistic, dualistic. Did you say? Is it? Is this no, written? Materialistic. A materialistic. Yes. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. Materialistic. Um, well, in as you know, Indian philosophy is very rich and diverse, and has covered most of the areas that uh, we would uh, consider to be philosophy in Europe as well. And amongst the schools of, of philosophy in India, we have, from a, even from the time of the Buddha, uh, materialists who believe that the world is just made out of atoms and things like that. My own view is that Gautama uh, was not a materialist and nor was he an idealist. Um, I don't think the Buddha was actually terribly interested in these kinds of ideas. Um, he was, if you look at the questions he refused to answer, there are a list of about 14 questions that he refused to say anything about. And one of them was the question, are the mind and the body the same? Are they different? Are they not the same? Da, 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 that kind of thing. And this question about materialism is basically a question about the nature of reality. Is reality just material? Materialists would say yes. Or is there a spiritual or a, 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 a some kind of non-material consciousness or mind uh, that also exists? And some philosophers, both in India and in Europe, uh, called idealists, will maintain there is no such thing as, as matter. Everything is just created by the mind. 
Now, these uh, forms of thought certainly emerged in India and amongst Buddhists in India as well. Um, but I, my sense is that Gautama Buddha um, did not consider these questions to be uh, productive, to pursue these kinds of questions. Um, he, 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 said, he doesn't deny these things. He just says, this is not what I'm interested in. And this to me would be another argument for the Dharma being primarily about morality or ethics, whichever term you choose. He's not interested in what is the nature of, of truth or reality. He's interested in how we can live better. He's interested in how we can cultivate and develop ourselves. He's interested in becoming more, more virtuous, more skillful in how we live. He's interested in how we respond to the world. And all of those areas are what we broadly call ethical or moral issues. That's what he's concerned about. And so issues about materialism and the views of Buddhism or uh, that, I don't think he would have really given much attention to. I don't think that really is so important. I think you can practice the Dharma, uh, wh whether you are a materialist or whether you are an idealist in your beliefs, I don't think it makes actually any difference to the moral and ethical issues that are primary in the Dharma. Okay, uh, should I take one last question? One last question, yeah, an easy one. Okay, one last, okay, this will, we, we have a few more questions, but okay, one last. Okay. How to be non-reactive in the midst of suffering? Yeah, well, that is a very, very good question and it is not easy. It's probably the greatest challenge of the Dharma is to actually be able to recognize and acknowledge the suffering of oneself, the suffering of those close to us, the suffering of the world, and not be reactive. Um, but to be non-reactive does not mean that you don't care. Um, if, let's say, your elderly mother or father is you know very very sick and, and and in great pain um notice the next time you find yourself in such a situation how you react on the one hand you might feel this is horrible this is terrible uh, you don't want to really be there you, you but you feel forced to and a non-reactive mind is able to say yes i care about you even though this is very difficult for me to deal with, more importantly is my love for you, uh, is my concern, my compassion, my empathy. But it's not easy to, to, to live from that space. Um, it's much easier just to go into the habit of, 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 of typical social reactions when someone's very ill, you say things like, I'm sure you'll get better. Or don't worry, it'll be okay in the end. This is a way of denying, or de this is a way of refusing to really embrace the situation. It's just a, a, a comforting thing to say. Um, but if you look at some of the, you know, people who work in the midst of hospitals and war zones, and the many, and yet what's so admirable about these people is they can be with these enormous difficulties and sufferings, and yet they can respond and they can work effectively in, in dealing with them. And that is a challenge all of the time, I find in my life, uh, to try to keep that non-reactive space that is also a compassionate space, um, uh, open and clear, even when things are really difficult. So I think that's a very good point on which to end. So thank you very much. Stephen, just uh, one thing I want to say. Uh, yeah. I want to ask, uh, actually, that was uh, my question. I want to add how to be a non-reactive even while taking an action. Well, my sense is that when, okay, um, I mean, action is a very wide term. Let me just use it in the case of my own work, when I'm giving talks or when I'm writing or whatever. I find that when I'm fully engaged with a situation, when I'm responding to it, then reactivity doesn't really 
play so much of a role anymore. I find that I can get into what some psychologists call a state of flow. Um, and that's very similar, like the stream of the path. That um, uh, once you get into that flow, once you get in touch with this non-reactive space within you, once you learn to, to cultivate these qualities, I think it becomes easier, I'm not saying easy, but easier uh, to maintain those qualities of mind, uh, even when you're struggling to cope with something that's very painful. And do we need any kind of practice to get that kind of awareness or consciousness? Well, we are um, I think most forms of contemplation or meditation are help in this way. And I do think uh, it's important uh, to have a regular daily meditation practice or a yoga practice. Some time in each day, maybe 30 minutes or so, where you stop and you just sit quietly or you do some asanas or you go for a, a quiet, silent walk just to have a time in the day when you come back to yourself. You don't let your busyness and your things you have to do preoccupy you. That you create these spaces of quiet, of stillness, of mindfulness, of attention. Um, and that I do think helps a great deal. Yeah. Yes, okay. Okay. thank you so much, Stefan. That's very enlightening, much healthy. Okay, so um, now we have, we are already running out of our time. So let's end our session here. But before that, let me thank uh, uh, Stephen for his uh, very precious time which he has given to this session and all the technical team behind this uh, uh, organizing the session and special thanks to Mangesh sir for organizing this. Uh, so Kshitis, could you please uh, display the that announcement uh, slides so there there is some there are some interesting uh, upcoming events by Steven so if you are interested and willing you could join this course which is uh, going to be in May every Sunday uh, so th the topic is explore four great tasks so there are some contact details on the poster itself so you may uh, register your name uh, for this uh, four weeks long course Okay, and there is another uh, talk on tomorrow by Christophe Jefferlot uh, on the title important on of Dr. Basa Ambedkar for today. So please do join this program and uh, I have enjoyed this session. So I hope you all uh, have enjoyed it and uh, thank you for tuning in and see you tomorrow. Thank, thank you, you everyone much. and thank you. Thank you.